This is going to be my last two video a week for a few weeks while I take a bit of a break. For the next few weeks I'm just going to be producing one video a week on a Friday to give myself a chance to have a bit of R&R &R and just take a breather basically. The main subject of this video is going to be a light-hearted look at E10 petrol here in the UK which is going to be thrust upon us at the beginning of September. I say light-hearted, hopefully there will be some useful facts and information in there for you. Who knows, stranger things have happened. And this is also relevant for my Indian viewers because next year, 2022, you're moving from E7 to E10. And then the following year, you're moving from E10 to E20. So this does apply to you as well. I know a lot of other countries like the US and most parts of Europe you've already had E10 for quite some time but it's going to be an unwelcome novelty here in the UK and hopefully some of you guys in the States and in Europe can fill in some of the blanks because information isn't very clear. Now before I get into that I've got a message from Sam at Merton Customs. He sends his apologies that as yet he's not been able to process the winners for the July photo competition. The reason being, some of the Covid restrictions were relaxed in Wales a couple of weeks ago. One of Merton's workers was pinged by the National Health app, telling him that he needed to self-isolate and get a test done, which later proved to be positive. The problem being that in the meanwhile he had exposed himself to other members of staff and had had to be sent home which sounded better in my head than when I said it out loud but I'm sure you understand what I mean. And this resulted in two thirds of Motone's workforce having to be sent home for self-isolation which is mandatory under these circumstances. Now next week things will be back to normal but it obviously has caused some delays with fulfilment of orders. Sam has assured me that next week he will have his top men on the job and they will be in catch-up mode so hopefully by the beginning of next week, middle of next week, things will be getting back to normal and hopefully I'll be able to tease the photograph competition results out of him. As a result there isn't going to be an August photo competition and I should also remind you that viewers of this channel get an exclusive 12% discount at Merton Customs using the discount code CHEESYNOBBLER and I'll leave that in the video description down below. Right, this E10 petrol milarkey then. I'm just going to let some old stock footage run in the background while I'm talking. Because to be honest, I'm in going on holiday mode and I really couldn't be asked to film anything. So here goes, E10 petrol, what is it and why do we need it? Well, personally, and this is just my personal opinion, I don't really think we do need it. I think it's just a global fashion that governments worldwide are buying into in order to be seen to be doing the right thing and perhaps collect a little bit of extra tax revenue. Mankind is a parasitic species. Our population has grown out of control, we've spread across the earth, and like a plague of locusts in biblical proportions, we're consuming the earth's resources and destroying the planet as we do so. Our oceans and rivers are cesspools, which in a lot of cases are unable to support life. And most of our usable landmass has at best been made worthless through intensive agriculture and at worst has been rendered toxic through industrial activity and landfill practices. Plastic waste is choking our oceans and this problem is getting worse by the hour. And as urgent as this problem is, world leaders have decided that what they should actually be doing is controlling CO2 emissions in order to combat climate change. So the planet will be not much more than a polluted, 
putrid, rotting corpse, but at least the weather will be more acceptable. Now, from experience, I find usually when I touch upon this subject, I get a slew of comments saying that, you know, we need to do this in order to protect our children and our grandchildren because they're going to pay the price for this if we don't. So I'll try to preempt those comments so I'm not wasting so much time dealing with them. They're going to pay for it anyway. It doesn't matter what we do or what government measures we accept. The global emissions gravy train is now rolling and it ain't going to stop. The problem is not so much what the population is doing. The problem is the growing size of the population that's doing it. I know this statement is going to be unpopular, but marvelling at the ever-growing size of your family tree and in doing so helping to exacerbate the whole problem and then lecturing me about the lifestyle changes I've got to make in order to compensate for what you have done is, in my view, selfish and unreasonable. Now, a year ago, maybe a couple of years ago, the government announced that in order to meet the UK's net zero emissions target by 2050, they were moving the deadline for electric vehicles to 2035. That is, from a predetermined date in 2035, all new vehicles must be electric, full stop. Now, I predicted back then that they would move that goalpost once again, and they have. They've now moved it to 2030, so we have nine years of the internal combustion engine, and then all that's going to be left for us, if we want to buy a new vehicle, is electric. Still no explanation as to how the technology is going to progress to make that happen in a practical way. Still no explanation as to where that electricity is going to come from. Because at the moment we are still very much relying on fossil fuel for energy production. And there is still a huge proportion of the industry telling us that unless we discover dilithium crystals or fairy dust mines, this ain't gonna happen, we're not gonna be ready on time. Just to put this into perspective, we've been perfecting the internal combustion engine for over a hundred years, well over a hundred years. And in that time we've improved its efficiency from around 5% to around 20%. Yet our government has given the industry nine years to solve all these insurmountable problems that we haven't been able to solve in the last hundred years and they're expected to magically find all the answers in nine years. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Now in the interim, in order to sort of make some progress towards these insurmountable goals, from the beginning of September here in the UK, we will be moving over to E10 fuel. The E means ethanol, we're currently running on E5, that is 5% ethanol. And E10 obviously will mean that we'll be running on 10% ethanol, so that's 10% of every gallon of fuel that we buy will be ethanol. Any internal combustion engine will run on ethanol. But there are some drawbacks to it, which I'll get into in a moment. Ethanol basically is plant-derived alcohol. And although they haven't made it clear whether this has to be domestically produced or whether we'll be importing it, the government has stated that this ethanol will be produced through substandard grain, surplus grain and sustainably sourced waste wood. Now, they've made a big thing of this because obviously if we're producing these crops specifically to produce alcohol for fuel, any CO2 savings will go straight out of the window because we're producing CO2 in order to produce it. Now, burning ethanol in our engines produces slightly less CO2 than burning petrol. And of course the idea is that it's renewable because that CO2 has only been bound into that alcohol recently. So it cuts down the contribution of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, or at least that's the theory behind it, compared to fossil fuels. 
In the UK, the government reckons that this will be the equivalent of removing 350,000 vehicles from our roads. Now, it remains to be seen how permanent this difference is going to be, because as I've said, our population is ever growing. And it's now very common for mummy and daddy to buy the son or daughter a car of some description as soon as they reach driving age and pass the test. It's an increasing trend which I think will have absorbed that difference by 2030 so we can probably look forward to E15 or E20 before that 2030 deadline. Now in India the circumstances are slightly different. Actually it depends which publication you read. The current E7 fuel will be replaced with E10 next year with E20 being made available the year after next in 2023. Although E20 won't become mandatory until 2025. So by and large, you guys will still have access to E10 or you should have access to E10 until 2025. Personally, I don't think that uh, filling stations are going to supply it because nobody's gonna want to buy it if they don't have to. Now, the reason that India is changing to these fuels is not because of any green policies. India, over the last 12 months or so, has been implementing a state of protectionism. They're putting huge tariffs on any imported goods, which is why Royal Enfield recently changed from Pirelli tyres and Avon tyres to the homegrown Seat tyres, which are actually good tyres. It's also one of the reasons that viewers from India have been complaining to me about the ever-increasing price of petrol. India doesn't really have its own domestic oil industry. It imports all of its fuel, or just about all of its fuel anyway. So in order to wean itself off that dependency from foreign suppliers, it's implementing these new ethanol mixed fuels in order to remove some of that dependency. Historically, this sort of protectionism doesn't really work long term. Eventually, other governments start to retaliate and your export business collapses with an ensuing acceleration in currency inflation. We'll see what happens with that. But what is of more of a worry is that they're going to have to give over more land for fuel production and it's going to require a lot of water. Now, India is quite reliant on groundwater which has been all but depleted again because of the burgeoning population. So there are some major hurdles for India to overcome in order to make this happen. Now India and the UK are late to the game with ethanol based fuels or ethanol mixed fuels. But those are basically the reasons why it's coming into play. And the big question that seems to be quite difficult to get answers on is what difference is this going to make to you and me, motorcyclists and drivers of cars? Well, I'll, I'll be honest, it's not good news, but it's not quite as bad as some scaremongers would have you believe. For a start, although ethanol does have a higher octane rating than petrol it bends with a lower efficiency that is it doesn't give out as much power per volume as petrol does now the authorities in the uk to my mind have been a little bit naughty because they're trying to convince us that this will only reduce efficiency by about one percent but when i looked at the energy values of petrol in relation to ethanol it was quite obvious it was going to be more than that i suppose they're just relying on us not checking the figures out the indian government have been a little bit more realistic with the figures that they've turned out and they reckon that the efficiency will drop by 3.5 to 5 percent depending on your engine and when they say efficiency that means both power and fuel consumption you're going to use more fuel per mile than you would with e5 or e7 petrol and of course in india when it goes up to e20 it's going to drop even more 
and obviously in all cases you're going to experience a loss in power whether it'll be noticeable or not is another matter the UK government says that this ethanol mix E10 is going to be 0.2 pence per litre cheaper to produce but a, I don't think that is going to offset the loss in performance and fuel economy that we're going to experience and B, just about every report I've read in other countries suggests that the price of this fuel is higher than conventional petrol. So again, here in the UK, I think we've been fed pork pies. Whichever way you look at it, driving or riding your bike is going to cost you more money per mile compared with the previous iteration of fuel that you've been using. But I think the truth is that the price of fuel, especially here in the UK, fluctuates so much on a weekly basis, you're possibly not going to notice the difference. Another problem with ethanol is that it's hygroscopic. It absorbs moisture from the atmosphere. So it doesn't store as well as petrol does. I have heard accounts from US viewers in the past that this has on occasion caused what they call phase separation where the fuel becomes useless or even damaging to the engine but these are only anecdotal accounts and to be honest it only generally happens if that fuel has been stored in your fuel tank for long periods of time I've looked up several resources on this subject and as far as I can tell this is only likely to be a problem if you're storing fuel in your fuel tank on your bike in excess of six months. But there is a way to combat it if it's worrying you and I'll cover that off before the end of the video. Now the final issue with E10 fuel is compatibility with your vehicle and this is a big one. A lot of resources tend to talk about motor cars rather than motor vehicles that don't include motorcycles. Yet as far as I can tell, the figures relating to the numbers that I'm going to talk about do appear to be figures that have been collated about motor vehicles as a whole, so it should include motorcycles. Ethanol is corrosive to certain materials that have in the past been used in motor vehicle manufacturer especially in the fuel system brass fiberglass and some plastics and rubbers are susceptible to damage now the automobile association here in the uk say that around about or just under a million vehicles that are currently on the road in the uk are not going to be compatible with e10 fuel the government gives a significantly low figure and simply puts the onus on the owner to ensure that they're using the correct fuel in their vehicle. Now I would say to anyone who is worried about this, check with the manufacturer of your vehicle to ensure that your vehicle in the year that it was manufactured is compatible with either E10 or E20 depending which of those grades you're up against. The UK government states that any vehicle made since 2011 should run on E10 just fine without any problems. But a little bit of research soon uncovers that some manufacturers don't recommend it in their vehicles. So that advice needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. Check with your manufacturer. One thing that the UK government has divulged is that mopeds 50cc motorcycles generally are not going to be compatible with e10 fuel and piaggio who i believe also own ducati and motor guzzi or motor gutsy if you live in america do not recommend the use of e10 fuel in their motorcycles actually their disclaimer was a little bit vague i would still check with them if i was you also owners of CCM motorcycles they think that their vehicles are compatible but they're not sure at the moment until they've completed some tests and trials so they're recommending that you stick to E5 for now. Now I personally think this is where some input from our European bikers and US bikers will come in handy 
where they run certain models of motorcycles and they're using E10 fuel. I'm sure they will have discovered by now which vehicles are and which vehicles are not compatible. At the end of the day, any motorcycle manufacturer making bikes for the international market should be making E10 compatible bikes. If they didn't, they would lose huge chunks of the market, but it is clear that some are not making sure that they're E10 compatible. The UK government has produced a facility online for people to find out whether or not their vehicles are compatible. Unfortunately, it's a very tiny list. A lot of manufacturers have obviously just not bothered to supply their input for this list. I will, of course, leave a link in the video description for that government model checker for anyone that wants to have a look. I couldn't find Royal Enfield on there. Uh, on behalf of my Royal Enfield viewers, I have approached Royal Enfield asking for the information, but they never came back to me with it. And to be honest, I just didn't have the time to keep chasing them up. Common sense tells me that the later models, the Interceptor, the Continental GT, the Himalayan, and the new Meteor should be just fine because they're all aimed at an international market. The older bullet and classic derived models might not be. I don't have an answer for you, so I would recommend that you bug Royal Enfield and get an answer from them. I'm sorry, I did make the effort with them. Your Japanese four should all be absolute fan. They're all on the list. Try them for on the list and you've got nothing to worry about right back till 1990. Harley Davidson have been compatible since the 1980s and BMW is of course also on the list. The big question mark for me is the smaller Chinese motorcycles that are offered on the market worldwide. None of those are on the list and I would have thought they'll be okay because they are sold in places like America and on the European continent but really who knows get in touch with your dealer or your importer and find out what the answer is. Now I'm presuming there's going to be a similar situation in India. I've not really got any definitive answers but certainly here in the UK all is not lost. If your vehicle is not compatible or you've got doubts as to whether it's compatible or not. E5 fuel is going to continue to be available in the form of super unleaded. Although obviously this fuel comes at a price, on average it's about 14 pence per litre more expensive than standard petrol, which will become E10. Now I think this is going to apply to people owning older vehicles or maybe budget vehicles or owners of vehicles that I've checked out and I have just reported on here. Your only alternative really is to swap over to E5 Super Unleaded. Also for anyone who is worried about this fuel deteriorating during the winter months while your bike's laid up, it might be a good idea the last tank fill of the year before you put the bike away to put E5 Super Unleaded in it just for peace of mind. Now if your bike or your car is not E10 compatible and you inadvertently fill it up with E10, don't worry, it's not going to self-destruct 100 yards from a filling station. The damage takes time to occur. Use the fuel up and then just make sure that you refill with E5 the next time and don't make a habit of it. The big thing about this of course that worries me is that people with vehicles that are likely not to be E10 compatible are, if you like, the more economically vulnerable people. I know that some people ride or drive older vehicles because they enjoy them, but a lot of people will be riding or driving these older vehicles because they can't afford to drive anything else. So the financial burden is going to be more marked for those people. People in low paid jobs that are dependent on those vehicles to get to work. It always seems to be the underdog that suffers in these situations. Right, I think I've got everything in that I needed to get in. I'm sorry if this has been a painful, long-winded video, but I did want to give out as comprehensive a list of information as I possibly can to help people out. And for the most part, the information given out by the government is pitiful. It's very sketchy. 
almost like they're going ahead with it, but they don't really want to own the consequences. And can I just quickly ask for the benefit of other viewers, if you live in the States or on the continent and you have a vehicle which you've discovered is not E10 compatible, please leave a short comment in the comment section just giving the make, model and the year of manufacture for the benefit of other people. Thanks very much. Right, I won't keep you any longer. So ride safely and I'll see you soon.